Unchurned. I'm Josh Schachter. I'm the founder and CEO of Update AI and the host of Unchurned. I'm incredibly excited about our episode today. Joining me is Harnish Kanani. Harnish is the Chief Customer Officer at Cloudflare. Uh, Harnish, thank you so much for being on the program. Well, thanks, Josh. appreciate the time to speak with you and the audience. So a little bit about Cloudflare. When I Google Cloudflare, this comes up. Cloudflare Incorporated is an American content delivery network and DDoS mitigation company founded in 2009. It primarily acts as a reverse proxy between a website's visitor and the Cloudflare customer's hosting provider. Its headquarters is in SF. Break that down for all of our listeners. We all, you know, many of us in the SaaS industry, of course, know Cloudflare. Help us kind of laymanize it a little bit, uh, exactly what you guys do. Josh, Cloudflare actually, you know, was, was set up around 12 years ago. And we've actually come a long ways from our launch of the company. We are quite a large player in what we call the networking and the security space. Uh, we have millions of customers over the time. We've been fortunate enough to serve a very large uh, customer base around the world. And we have one mission. Our mission is to make the internet better for everyone. Whether you're a you know, journalistic website or whether you're an election website or you're an enterprise looking to secure your uh, networking properties, we are the solution. We have a platform and we serve millions of customers using this platform. So over the last 12 years, we've again grown quite a bit. Our, we play a very important role in many different areas, uh, a lot of it in the networking and, and security space. But we've been fortunate enough to serve a very large market with one goal in mind, which is to improve improve the internet for everyone. That's an ambitious goal, <laughs> improving the improving the internet. Uh, I, I like that. Shoot for lofty goals, right? Um, and 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 you do serve a large market. You serve over one hundred and fifty thousand paying customers. Your group specifically serves uh, enterprises that are within your your existing customer set. You oversee all of post sales except support and you're serving over a billion dollars in ARR. Did I get all that correct? All of that is true. Yeah. I mean, it's th th those numbers are, are monstrous, monumental. And uh, I, this is going to be a great conversation because I really want to learn about how, how operations run at that, at that size and scale. Before we go straight into that, I want to work backwards a little bit and get to learn a little bit more about Harnish as a person because we call this, this, this podcast Unchurned. We want to get raw, authentic, learn about you. Because you are an inspiration, you've built your career in such a tremendous way, and so we, you know, others can take out of that. Where were you born, and where do you live now, Harnish? I was born in uh, Mumbai, India, uh, many years ago, and uh, I'm based out of the Bay Area since around 2000, so 23 years locally. What what brought you over from Mumbai to the United States? So I uh, I started my career back in uh, the mid 80s, and uh, I have since then. Uh, from the beginning, spent a large portion of my time just serving enterprise customers. So a lot of my first few years back in the day was were with a large organization called Tata's, and we were a management consulting firm and a technical consulting firm. And from day one, back in that time, all I've done is in the initial days, I built code. I was a programmer for around eight years. And then as I grew through my career, I began to serve large and small customers in a consulting fashion. And then around 2000, I decided that I actually, instead of being a consultant on the other side of the table, I actually wanted to be inside of a company and serve the same customers in a post-sales fashion. So all of my last 30 plus years have been dedicated to serving large and small enterprise customers. I, I get it. Consulting is an amazing place to learn, but at some point you get, you get that itch to go out there and, and execute on those operations yourself. What's something that you've got 200 people working for you, build a lot of influence. What's something that a lot of those people would be surprised perhaps to learn about you? So look, I, uh, you know, in the culture that I'm building here, as well as what I built in the prior companies, one of the biggest things that works for me is to wake up every day and be ready to serve the customer. If you don't wake up every morning to serve your customer, or if, if at night when you go to bed, if you aren't fulfilled by serving customers or focusing on their success, then it's a wrong job for you. So, so what works for me is to wake up every morning and say, hey, look, what do I need to do to serve my customers in, in many different aspects? So as you think about how what would surprise my team, if they ever found me misrepresenting ourselves, then that would surprise them because that's not the culture we are building or, or I would ever want to build. What would surprise them is if we were we were constantly working with our customers to you know cover up for any product gaps or, or delivery gaps. That's not the culture we are building. So 
a lot of the the people that I work with or the people that I've hired or trained or coached or mentored, we are driven to delivering success on a day in and day out basis. And that's the team I partner with. That's the team I'm proud of. Let's talk about customer success. So, you know, there, there's there's several models out there for how you take a new customer, um, an account that's, and, and you deal with enterprise accounts and, and transition that account into the post sales space. I want to learn about how that works at Cloudflare. You know, who was really at the center quarterbacking this journey and how that transition takes place? Yeah, that's a good question, Josh. You know, as, as we've embraced the model here at Cloudflare, one of the important lessons for us that we've learned is how do you continue the relationship that an account executive or a solution engineer establishes at the first instance when you meet with a prospect? How can we continue that relationship through the journey? So like you rightly said, there are several models in the industry around how an enterprise account gets transitioned to a post-sales team. The way, the better way to look at this is from an outside-in perspective and to look at this from a customer experience perspective. I believe we should look at this through the lens of the customer to make sure that they have an awesome experience with how they see the company, the value that they are deriving from our solutions, and the experience they are receiving from the company. Again, at Cloudflare, we have chosen to look at this from a customer's perspective, and we have tailored our service aligned with the journey they have with us. Starting with the account executive and the solution engineer who touches our customers first, we've decided that the account executive is the right quarterback on the account so that the initial relationship the customer has stays long-term and stays throughout. So that account executive stays with you. They're there, obviously, before the sale is, is converted, and then they're there for indefinitely through the relation through the life of the relationship. Yeah. And as the customer success team and the support team gets introduced to the customer during that initial engagement with the prospect, we want to make sure that those relationships are additive and incremental to the relationship that the AE and the SE already have established. You and I know that along the journey of the customer, there are going to be more and more folks who interact with the customer. Product team talks to the customer. We have product managers who talk to the customer. We have solution architects. We have sales specialists. But we have decided at Cloudflare that those relationships continue to enhance the partnership further. But it's always important to let the AE be the quarterback on the account so that the customer has a unified experience all the way from their prospecting stages all the way through the journey with us. Is there any particular way that you introduce these these new functions that come in and interact with the customer? Because it can be overwhelming for sure, right? Uh, as a new customer, of, let me introduce you to so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. Is there any particular practice that you guys have taken up to demonstrate the most value in those new functions that are being introduced? So very, very early in the, in the sales cycle, as you know, think about a customer's experience, as they begin to validate if their problem or their use cases are served by the Cloudflare solutions or platform, the AE and AC take that first big step and, and in, in explaining the value and in validating the use case is, is fulfilled by our solutions. As the customer is getting closer to contracting with us, they have questions which typically include, hey, look, how do I onboard myself? Now, Cloudflare, knowing we serve millions of customers, a large portion of our solutions are actually can be self-onboarded. But for the customers that are at an enterprise level, they, their businesses are complex. They need more guidance. Some of, a lot of people choose one-on-one uh, -on -one handholding. So before a contract gets signed, we typically get introduced, we as in the customer success team gets introduced to the customer during that time. Say, so, hey, look, let me make sure you feel comfortable with the team that is going to get you onboarded or implemented. And here's Harnish or Harnish's team that, that is being introduced to you. We also at the same time introduce our support folks because they are going to be our 24 by 7 support organization that is around our world. So in the before you even sign the contract, a lot of these relationships are put in place and the account executive reaffirms the fact that, hey, I'm, I'm going to be your quarterback, but I'm going to bring time and again different specialists from the organization to serve your business needs. So we do get introduced uh, before even the contract gets signed. So it's not just all dumped on them as soon as the contract, it, you don't overwhelm them, you layer it and uh, stagger it in a meaningful way. Yeah, a lot of the times by the time the contract is signed, we want to be in a place where they've had the initial introduction, they are exposed to the value we bring, they understand if they're buying a premium success offering, they understand the value that they are deriving, why would they pay for such an experience? 
So a lot of that is actually uh, done somewhat before the contract gets signed. There's a lot of conversation among CS leaders around segmentation. I'd like to know how Cloudflare segments their customers. How do you go about that? Look, I, I think segmenting a customer base is, is, is a good industry best practice. And each of the organizations or each company actually has to determine, you know, how a customer gets served. How do we serve them? What is the propensity of the customer to buy? What are the complexity of their business needs? How soon is the customer willing to adopt your solution or how aggravated is the problem that they are trying to solve? So there are, there are a certain number of, uh, what I would say, levers that we use to decide what's the right level of service. I'll, I'll give you three or four just to begin the conversation. Yeah. I feel that the I feel that the most important decision for a CCO or a head of success in an organization is how to use a, a defined set of resources that are given to that customer success officer to to deliver the goods to to all of their customers. So here's what we look at. Number one, we look at the needs and complexity of the customer's business. You know, it's the first thing that's top of mind for me or any head of success is the needs of the customer. What, which customer needs which customer needs what service? What service is appropriate for the customer? For example, Josh, I'll tell you that different size customers need different levels of service. So when a customer's business is more complex or they are trying to de- de- derive value from our solutions that are that have complexity, where they have multiple lines of businesses, or they are using in in today's world multiple VPN tunnels, and they are trying to replace that connection. We have to first, my, my first dimension is what is their need, how urgent it is, how is the complexity of their business so that I can obviously deliver the service that is appropriate for them that they, they have obviously signed us up for. A second and third is the size of the company and the vertical which they are in. For example, if you look at a cloud native company, they tend to be a lot more technologically savvy and they most times have resources that understand the complexity of uh, implementing a security solution or a networking solution. And our service level with them is slightly different because they are well-educated. On the flip side, if you look at a a consumer packaged goods industry, well, their job is not that. Their their job is to go sell consumer packaged goods products, but they don't necessarily have all the IT resources or security or networking resources. So our service level to them is slightly different because they don't have the readiness. How How do you vet that out initially? It's a lot of the discovery call, Josh, that we are having with the customer. So when somebody is about to, let's say, as an example, implement a zero trust uh, strategy, zero trust is a state of business. And so there's a bunch of solutions that deliver that zero trust. In my discovery call or my team's discovery, we really ask the customer, say, hey, look, here are five things that get you to the zero trust state. How prepared is your team? Can I really talk to some of your engineers who we can work with? And through that discovery process, we assess the level of their competency. And then we actually have to agree on the speed with which they want to adopt the solution. We have obviously many tools in our bag that that include workshop-based engagement model at the high end or remote guidance as at the low end. So a lot of the service level, back to your question, Josh, a lot of the, for that particular segment, what's the right level of service is an art. Uh, we go through a discovery process to make sure that the customer feels comfortable and we can align with their speed and timing as we bring them on board onto our solutions. Makes sense. I'll, I'll say one a couple of more things. So, so I presented a lot of the customer uh, point of view, starting from their needs, their size, the vertical, the speed, the readiness of the teams. From a company perspective, which is a vendor perspective or the, the solution provider, we also have to look at some of what we are trying to accomplish. And so I call that company strategy. You know, are you trying to win a large market? Are you newer in the market? Do you need more referenceable customers? How do you build the referenceability with your initial customers if you're a startup? Uh, we also look at market conditions. So knowing that in this tough a market, when the economy market is tough, I expect that my customers won't have the resources they need or they might be short on their staff and so we help them with a higher level of service because I know they are in a tougher market. So again, more of an art than science, uh, but we are very sensitive to a customer's needs and want to align our service level to what they want and the speed with which they want to move. 
I, I counted uh, seven or eight different levers levers that you pull. So the needs and the complexity of the customer and their business, what they what they want, of course, something that you capture during during your discovery. The size of the company uh, makes a difference for sure. The vertical you mentioned, um, you talked about vertical, but I don't think it was necessarily like automotive versus fintech versus healthcare, right? It was more vertical. To me, it sounded more like it was um, generally like how tech savvy of a company are they? Is that, is that correct? Yeah, I would yep. uh, rephrase it to, to mean that. Yep. And then the readiness of the company to, to spend and execute. Uh, the readiness of their of their team to to get going into the the project and their competency, their their propensity to buy, how much they want to spend, of course, is going to influence the resources and the investment that you put behind them. The the strategy basically, which kind of goes hand in hand with their propensity to buy, and then their market conditions, everything, all the externalities around them. That's a lot. Um, did did I did I get that right, more or less? Yeah, I, I would say so. I, I you know. And and the premise behind all this is when you are in the market, public or private company, the customer success team has a certain pool of resources, whether it's funds or people. And so you really want to decide for yourself, how do I take this finite set of people or pool of money to service all of our customers, but with the right levels? And that causes you to segment them and agree on the service level. But but you were right about the seven or eight uh, parameters I, I spoke. I mean, about. this is this is uh, this is Sim City for adults, right? You've got a pool of money and, and you have to play yeah. around with it to develop the overall the best community. So uh, do, do you like what are the actual tools, the toolings that you use uh, to, to do this? You're, is it a team that you have behind you? Is there a certain kind of modeling that you guys have created? So we do this. We do this twice a year. Josh, uh, obviously coming into the year as as we approach our finance team and our CFO for a certain amount of funds in, in the subsequent year, obviously you do this analysis at the beginning of the year, whatever your financial year is. And then we do reassess six months into the year because, because you know, the, there's, a, there's a lot of time in that six months and a lot of things change, uh, economies, uh, people's needs, market conditions. And so we do this twice a year we reassess what we want to go to market with in terms of our service levels. We run surveys along the way. We are polling our customers. We are looking at how they see our service level. And then in six months, we are reassessing, say, hey, what levers do we need to tweak or adjust? Uh, but that that's working for us as a twice a year process. So it's a constant data co- collection. I assume it's quantitative and qualitative. I mean, you said there's surveys, but then obviously like the metrics of, of their usage and all that sort of thing. So it's it's a combination of quant and qual that you're continuously capturing and you have a process and a playbook in place from your frontline teams to do that. And then, like you said, semi-annually, you're going through each of the major accounts and you're reviewing based on those inputs, where where should they be and what level of service should you deliver? And, and so it's kind of a dynamic semi-annual uh, adjustment. How do you work with the CFO of Cloudflare to forecast and get budget? Look, I, I must say this, you know, this is actually one of the most current focus areas for many different CXOs. You know, I was uh, I was at a conference around four, six weeks here ago, and, and this was one of our biggest topics. So, but in talking with peers across our industry, we see, and, and in the lack of clarity we have around the economy in, in 2023, it's really making it difficult for people like myself or my peers in the industry on how to really forecast growth in, in the revenues for 2023 and as a result of which, it's really difficult for CS organizations to go request a sizable budget from their finance organizations because there isn't much clarity. There's a there's a lack of uh, there's a lack of clarity for sure, but there's uncertainty around business growth, not just for Cloudflare or any of our competitors, just in the industry in general. So look, I there are three types of organization and how how they look at their CS related budget. So I'll give you, you know, three different types of companies. So number one is if you're an organization, typically a startup, you look at the cost of CS as something that is necessary to develop your business and build a set of referenceable customers to help propagate the company and the company's product. So think about the first type of organization are startups, and they obviously look at the cost of CS as an investment to making sure they their solutions are accepted in the market and they have a good success rate. A second type of organization wants who wants to invest in the CS team and function while making sure the cost of CS does not bleed or dilute the subscription gross margin. So think about a public company 
who has a finite set of resources based on the margin you're trying to hit in the market, these organizations try and strike a balance between how much they can afford to invest uh, to meaningfully grow the referenceable customers while also making sure it does not negatively impact the gross margin that they are reporting into Wall Street. So that's the second type. The last type of organization, Josh, is, is highly mature companies. These are large established players in the market who have built sizable market presence and they are relying on their customers to request CS services where essential and where needed. These are organizations who have built value-added services that customers want to purchase, but and that allows the company to charge premium rates, and that helps prevent the dilution of the subscription margin, or where the size of revenue is included separate from subscription revenue and margin. So think about these being several billion dollars in size. They offer services, they charge a premium. I would the, the name that comes to mind is Salesforce. Today, they are a premium organization that can charge for every services. So back to your question, depending on the type and size of organization you are and whether you're a public or private, it makes it either easier or tougher to request budgets from your CFO. Yeah. At Cloudflare, obviously, you asked about how, I, how we look at this. At Cloudflare, we focus on building our solutions and platform in a way that is self-onboardable. As you know, we have millions of customers and a large portion of these customers who are not paying us and who are uh, served by us for free, uh, they are self we, they are self onboardable. Our solutions are self onboardable. We provide a lot of uh, what's called self onboarding materials, artifacts, links where customers feel comfortable. Uh, the only what I would say is that, is that the large portion is, is that customer base, the enterprise customer. They they could actually use this self onboardable techniques, but they reach out for our services more because their businesses are complex or they are trying to attain a zero trust state over a number of months or quarters. That's the type of people who actually come to us and say, hey, look, we'd like some best practices from Cloudflare. And that's where my team gets involved. And just a little bit of industry jargon. I'm sorry. What is zero trust state in your world? So look, as COVID has come in over the last two, two or three years and people have uh, people have gotten accustomed to working in that environment. A lot of us no longer go into the office. We are remote. And so we dial in from our home and our home networks and our home offices. And what has happened over the last three or four years is there's been a lot of now dependency on people dialing from home. So the older ways of connecting your home office to your corporate servers no longer works. If you remember the term VPN or virtual private network, that was a lot of what happened, and that's what we used many, many years ago. Well, none of those are secure, and, and so the world is getting a lot more complex. Security is becoming a real challenge for a large portion of the companies. And so the concept of zero trust defines how you can attain that, uh, how you can attain that state for a company where you basically trust no one. And so you have to secure your networks, your connectivity, your connections from your home office to the corporate server in a way that you don't know who's logging in or who's dialing in or who's connecting in, trust no one, and that's zero trust. With that zero trust state, basically, how do you how do you let your employees connect, your partners connect in a way that like, the connection is extremely secure and you're not attacked or, or under breach by anyone? So zero trust is a state that a company is, is striving to attend. And for that to happen, you have to make some changes in your networking and your security solutions. You seem like such a, a friendly and warm person, Harnish. I'm, I'm, I'm shocked to hear that you trust nobody. Uh, <laughs> I joke. So the, the last question that, that I want to go on to is around um, a concept that I've heard more and more about lately. It was actually um, advocated by Jeffrey Moore months ago at Gainsight's Pulse conference. And we had him on the on the show, and he was talking more about this as well, but customer maturity and the customer maturity model, what does that look like? First of all, what is the customer maturity model and what does it look like at Cloudflare? Josh, again, heads off to Jeffrey Moore, but the conversation in the market for the last many years for customer success in general is, how do you assess the value that a customer is deriving from your solution? When somebody spends a million bucks, it is my job to constantly communicate back to the customer of the value that they are deriving and what could I do to enhance that value. And so many, many companies, many, many uh, CCOs like myself have struggled to build compelling model that allows me to very clearly and succinctly clearly 
communicate the value we delivered to the customer. This allows the customer as well to hear from us on a regular basis to take it back to their boards or their board of directors or their CEO say, hey, look, here's the value we are deriving. So, you know, at Cloudflare, Josh, we believe in working with our enterprise customers as partners in business. And in this relationship with our customers, it's extremely important for us to share that value we are delivering. So one of those tools we specifically designed uh, for this purpose is what we call customer maturity models, CMM for short. The goal of this model, Josh, is to clearly communicate to a customer, number one, how are they using our platform? Number two, where are there more opportunities for them to gain additional ROI? Number three, what does it take to be the best in class? And lastly, how do they compare to the rest of their peer group? Not only that, our our CS team is actually able to work with these individual customers to have them attain the best in class with each product within our platform. So a simple view of this, Josh, is if I, if you are my customer and I came onto a call with you and said, hey, look, you scored a really good 76 on a score of 100. Feel proud about yourself because you, you're, a, you're a great customer. You're leveraging our solutions and you scored a certain number on, on a scale of 100. And your next question to me is going to be, well, I did score 76. That's good news. But what are my peers doing? And if I were to ever tell you, say, hey, your peers scored at 86, your first question to me is, well, how can I not only get to 86, but what does it take to get to 100? Totally. This dialogue is very important, Josh, between us and our customers saying, look, my job is to get you to 100. My job is to create an adoption roadmap that takes you from zero to 100, depending on your speed and how fast you want to work with us to get you to 100, because that's my job. That's when I'm going to feel good and you're going to feel good. So the models that we developed at Cloudflare in this CMM or customer maturity model, we use metadata from our entire customer base of millions of customers with industry trends. And, and we, those, these trends are aligned with what is called a SASE framework from Gartner. How do you, what, sorry, the, the SASE framework, is that uh, like, like attitude, SASE, like how do you spell SASE framework just for people that so want to look at Spelled as S-A-S-E, uh, you know, it's a, it's a framework that Gartner, who's a leading analyst presented in the market to look at networking and security solutions. So obviously Google out SASE framework from Gartner. And what we've done, Josh, is as customers are embracing our security and networking solutions, we look at the use of our solutions. We actually rank them from around five different levels. You know, are you a basic user of this particular solution? Are you an advanced user? Are you a best in class? And we talk to, this is a dialogue with the customer saying, hey, look, here's how you fared across these five different levels. And here's how your peer group fared. And my job or my customer success team's job is to get you to the best in class. So let's go work on some items from here on. We call them playbooks or runbooks. And it takes them from point A to point B. That's the job of the CS team. That's what we do day in and day out to make sure the customer is elevated from the lowest levels of use to best in class for each of the solutions that they buy from us. Wonderful. Arnish, you've given us so much depth into an insight into the processes and your strategies at Cloudflare. Um, I wish you nothing but the very most success heading into 2023. And I want to thank you so much for being on our episode. Thanks, Josh. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. 